I'm Mina Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table. The 24th of January is the United Nations International Day for Education, which is a day that is used to promote and to have conversations about education around the world and to highlight all the efforts that people and organizations around the world have been making and working towards for the cause of education. And the United Nations also has a set of sustainability goals that the global community would like to meet by the year 2030. And one of those development goals, you know, number four, which is you know, top five, is to ensure the inclu an inclusive and equitable good quality education for children around the world. And given that even now, according to United Nations statistics, 617 million children around the world can't read or do basic math, we clearly have our work cut out for us. And today I'm welcoming two wonderful people on the show who are going to help me dissect this sustainability goal number four and also look at it in terms of the policies that we have in place here in Pakistan and all the wonderful work that many organizations are doing doing to help bring books to our kids and bring learning to our children who are so bright and you know deserve a better future. I'm delighted to be welcoming today with me Mr. Abdul Sami Khan who is a specialist in education policy and planning. He's worked on the national educational policy for Pakistan and has led an educational sector plan development project in Balochistan. And joining me on set today is Ms. Bela Raza Jumail, who is the CEO of Idara e Talimo Agahi, which is a center for education and consciousness. She is a policy specialist and activist. She's a former advisor to the Federal Ministry of Education and is the founder of the Children's Literature Festival and the Teachers Literature Festival, which is great because you know teachers should have one too. And she also leads Asar Pakistan, which is a citizens accountability learning initiative. Welcome to the show. Zaweel thank you and mr khan from across the internet <laughs> <laughs> this is very exciting so i was looking at this sustainability development um, you know plan the goal and it it has sort of it's, it seems like a multifaceted approach to the whole idea of education and how it should be imparted so i just kind of want to take it apart but before we do that i'm curious that when we talk about an education what does that mean well, I think uh, the whole, I mean, that in itself requires a whole show. <laughs> but, uh, Mina, to make it brief, I think the whole idea is, does education give you, in Amartya Sen's notion, those sense, mm. those capabilities mm. that enable you to live your life fully and meaningfully? Mm. And certainly the element of happiness should be there. Yeah. So if you are capable and you are, you can figure out life's complex problems, mm apply knowledge mm -hmm. and feel that you have come to the other end of the tunnel, yeah. certainly it makes you feel very empowered. Mm. So capabilities, empowerment, possibilities and happiness all go together as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Now, does an education system do that mm. for it? I mean, you know, will it do it for a child? Yes. Do we design a program such that mm. your children, if they go to a school, they come back feeling, oh, I can do it. Huh. Oh, I know how to solve this uh, hmm. or figure hmm. this one out or ask a qu right question huh. of, oh, I've done it and feel really happy that they've done it. It's that, it's that level of enabling and caring hmm. in a system. And I dare say even a, a system which gives a sense of protection to the child or the learner to feel, you know, this is a caring place huh. and where uh, doors keep shutting on you hmm. and you feel, oh my God, you know, like Tare Zameen Pe, you can't ah. still figure out things are jumping in front of you. Yes. And not being able to make sense, it is a tragedy. In many countries, by yes. the way, in the world, where those 670 or 17 million children are not, are in school but not learning, hmm. it means that they have not been able to uh, figure out hmm. what basic foundational learning means and hence they feel that the work is a world is a very dark place for them quite right and it seems like you said a tragedy i think is a very good word to use that it's been so many years achieve those goals or targets and they don't have those skills and like there's clearly and this is like a global problem that there is a gap that somehow we're not being able to address even now. And it seems simple on one level, it seems simple that you know you have teachers, you have a classroom, children go learn things yes. and it should be easier than this, but clearly it's, it's not. not. 
and therefore you know it's not just children who are out of school about yes. 19 million plus children mm. by the time children in class five are not learning an ah. epic tragedy has occurred huh it's very difficult to you know reset anything after grade five. Oh gosh that's <laughs> something i want to sort of cycle back to mm. also but mr khan what's the difference between education and literacy Yes, um, uh, literacy is a subset of education, and uh -huh. I think what Vela Saiba just described is a very comprehensive definition of what education is. Literacy is an, is an enabler. Hmm. So, you know, the ability to read and write and do basic numeracy, hmm. uh, there can be various definitions. But if it's not allowing you to explore the possibilities that you have as an individual in life, then literacy alone is not education. And, and, hmm. and that's a clear distinction we have to make. A lot of literate people out there whom you can say are not educated and vice versa also. So yes. literacy at best is a very important enabler but a subset. Huh, because I feel like, you know, when we talk about statistics and we talk about the census, for example, we're always looking at a literacy rate. And so in Pakistan, what, what does literacy mean for us in Pakistan? Because I know that there's a certain kind of level that you have to sort of achieve to be called literate. Okay, so... Uh, there's a defi definition of the Ministry of Education. Bela Saiba would be more aware of the exact definition. But the, the key problem is that this literacy is not something that we are actually, we've actually tested and seen what that means. It's a mm. self-declared literacy. Nobody has actually done a sample-based testing of what exactly does it mean. You know, we're saying literacy, yes. X percentage, you yes. sample see whether it fits into that definition that you're trying to uh, ask of the respondent. So even within these limitations, the literacy rate is low. I mean, if you calculate from 1947, the first uh, population census was probably 51, and the literacy rate was 11 percent. Right. Today it's about uh, 60 or 70, so it's not even 1 percent per year uh, growth rate, even within these limitations. I think just adding to what Sami just said, yes. that, you know, um, the World Bank uh, for Pakistan and for the rest of the world has just recently come up with the mm -hmm. notion of learning poverty. Okay. And that means that any child in school, out, school, out of school who's 10 years of age mm. can read uh, a paragraph with comprehension. Okay. So Pakistan's learning poverty rate last year when it was launched, mm. or year, just a little bit year before, 2019 December, it was 75%. Oh. And already under the COVID period, it is being projected to have risen another 5% to about 80%, maybe even more. So, hmm. so it's learning poverty, literacy, and we've got many, many definitions, as, hmm. as Sami said, including things like being able to read a newspaper hmm. online or something with understanding or hmm. being able to sign your... So, you know, these are... Uh, but, you know, when you are looking at fundamental lower primary level, you were talking about hmm. SDGs. Hmm. And SDGs, uh, the goal is divided into seven targets and three means of implementation. Hmm. The first one looks at whether a child, uh, gender disaggregated girls and boys, hmm. can actually do basic literacy and numeracy. Yes. And then says, okay, that is by lower primary, which mm -hmm. is grades two and three, mm -hmm. or upper primary, which is grade five or six, depending which country, mm -hmm. and lower secondary, which is eight or nine, okay? Mm -hmm. So the ASAR work, for example, yes. that we do is at lower pitched at content from and competencies from lower primary. Right. So if you even take that as what is seen as foundational literacy and numeracy, ah. then the... I mean, as I said, the tragedy hits when you say, oh, even now 41% children hmm. cannot, this is overall, yes. cannot uh, read um, or uh, do basic maths for grades two and three in grade hmm. five. Hmm. So if in grade five, yes. you have still got more than 50% children yes. not being able to do those fundamentals, hmm. well then that is your literacy or numeracy challenge. Huh. And after five years of formal I schooling. Mean, uh, five years. And you still can't you sort still of can't. do We still have basic. about 13% children huh. or 11% in grade eight not being able to do that. So oh when gosh. we look at, when we do our mapping and our hmm. assessment surveys, and that is all to almost 300,000 children in Pakistan hmm. across every district. Who are in school. In school or out of school, doesn't oh, matter. Okay. We go to the household mm. and every child who's 5 to 16, we said, bas bed jao, huh. we'll do the <laughs> survey. When we do the survey, we still, we, we have it by age 
and we have by grade if yeah. child is in school or not mm. in school right and then it shows it's tragic to see even 11 13 percent children and it varies from province to province or district to district cannot still do grade two level hmm. literacy and numeracy so i mean for all practical purposes yes. that is your literacy and numeracy definition hmm. if kids people cannot do grade two level foundational literacy and numeracy hmm. well we are in big trouble so this to me sounds like a problem of quality of education so so can we sort of would it be fair to kind of then break that down into uh, the quality of teachers in schools and then also curriculum where then both of the things have to kind of work hand in hand for children to be able to learn because but what I'm curious about is that a child in school and in a formal school environment has a teacher, has books, is being taught a certain, certain some curriculum, there has to be something. But then why don't, why aren't they being able to learn? Like what's, what's happening there? So I wish it was just teachers and curriculum. Hmm. There's so many elements and Sami will vouch for it as well that, you know, so you start at the back end. How are we set for the kind of testing and assessments which we are so driven by? Yes, because you know, everything seems to everything be about, is about you know, shaming exams. and shaming. Everything is about high stakes. Even when a child, as you've seen, those from, uh, even in elite schools, yes, they first. have graduation ceremonies mm. for early childhood, and you say they're actually wearing <laughs> gowns. Yes, so they are. In our heads, we are constantly making a child compete with something which has got nothing to do with the child. Huh. In the sense that the child comes with his or her own level of learning. You're not bothered about that. You say, class one, mein to this has to happen. Yes. Iska test hoga. Class five, mein iska test hoga. So when you are hmm. constantly pitching yourself to these high stakes tests, hmm. even though the government policy may be, you know, we're not going to have tests yes. or we're not going to have exams. Yes. There'll be automatic promotion. That comes hmm. with its own challenges. But then when you have grade five, grade eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 tests, hmm. and the examination system is such that you, the whole pedagogy and all so-called successful schools hmm. seem to be pitching at how to pass that, hmm. irrespective hmm of whether the child, what is the child's baseline level of learning? Huh. And then you look at that child and say, okay, I'm going to adjust the curriculum, the textbook, the assessment huh. to that child and let yes. the child move ahead. So this constant notion of pushing the child hmm. into a template hmm. without really knowing what the child comes with yes. is where, and you know, it's not like I'm saying, okay, customize. Yes, I'm saying huh. customize in a way but it doesn't have to be that difficult. Huh. If you can just do a, as we do, a very light touch assessment hmm. without terrifying the child or the yes. parent or yes. anyone, and just doing a light touch to understand what is the real level of the child, and then adjust the curriculum, huh. the pedagogy, huh. the huh. assessment to that. Yeah. Now that is a kind of a paradigm. What do you think about this? Because I do think that we are sort of very much uh, just results oriented and not really looking at the process of learning or the journey of it. I, I think I'd just like to uh, pull back a little and, and go into a perspective of yes. uh, what is being discussed. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Let's, let's first look at numbers. Hmm. So by the time you're talking about the secondary school exam, hmm. Depending on the province, mm. anywhere from 60 to 80 percent children have already left school. Oh, all right. Mm. So, uh, whatever we are doing with those leftovers, I'm sorry, it's not a good word to use. But or residual can, students. Right? Mm. But you see, and then as you go to the intermediate, you even lose even more. I mean, by the time you go into higher education, it's a single digit percentage. Oh, now, wow. So, what 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 Bela Sahaba was initially mentioning the, the the loss by grade five that is the key that hmm. is the key and and it the, the problem lies in what happens inside the classroom hmm. and what goes into that classroom is the context of the child when uh, the the test for a good education policy is how is it helping the child is it child centered are you reaching the child and you know meeting the child where the child is. Yes. And that is something that is not happening. So a lot of time, teachers get a lot of flack. And, and mm. I'm not saying that we have a very high teaching uh, force, but it's not as bad as sometimes the results come out because there's a complete disconnect 
between the expectations of the curriculum and textbooks hmm. and the reality on ground of the child. So, so you know, we are what we I, I normally say is we fail good and bad teachers equally. And the reason for that is that we never look at data. We never look at information. We never try to work back on that data and try to understand what exactly is going wrong. Hmm. Asir has been producing data literacy for the last so many years. Yes. We had the first national education investment. Work back and see, and, and you realize that there's a, this is a diverse country. There's a lot of diversity. Children need, especially in the early grades when they begin schooling, uh, they need, you need to understand how they will learn before you can mm. take them where you want to. It's not something, I mean, I'm not even talking about the technicalities. Much more research needs to go into developing a curriculum and textbook before you know whether the child is going to learn or not. And it's an ongoing process. Right. But all that information is, is lying waste. Nobody is going into that research. Nobody is utilizing it. Wow. OK, we're going to take a very quick care while I process this information. <laughs> Stay with us. Welcome back to The Coffee Table. We're having a fascinating conversation about education and the gaps that we are facing in sort of addressing how we can make our classrooms an effective learning space with Mr. Abdul Sami Khan and Ms. Bela Raza Jamil. So before the break, we were talking about how we need to adjust our learning pedagogies according to the classrooms that we have. And these are obviously strategies that are being implemented around the world. And, you know, we were talking about this in the break also, that in countries or in areas where there is a low density of children, like you told me about some places in Australia, where there just aren't that many kids. And then the school room does imply that you have to kind of get children of different learning stages into one classroom. But it can be done. It's not an impossible thing. And there are strategies to train teachers and to kind of adjust it according to each child's or group's needs. So I think that that sort of leads us to another aspect of this SDG, which is an equitable education. Now, what does that imply? So equitable means many things. Hmm. First of all, I think it comes into the whole notion of what is seen as both inclusive hmm. and equal to all. Right. Right. And that means that every child has an equal opportunity mm -hmm. of being able to build that equity hmm. in what would be seen as a learning business. You know, it's hmm. a learning. The yeah. story is of a learning journey. Hmm. And uh, does it allow uh, every child, uh, rich, poor, hmm. uh, with all kinds of abilities, yeah. to be able to, or any gender, to be able to have those opportunities that enable that child huh. Huh. to have quality learning, hmm. as we were discussing yes. earlier. Yes. Now, the question is that that in itself then, uh, then impinges on what would be seen the next bit on the SDG 4, hmm. which is inclusive as well. Yes. So equitable and inclusive overlap. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, just so that, you know, in terms of the terminologies being used, it just becomes simpler. Okay, equitable and inclusive do overlap hmm. because then you have to see discriminatory practices inside the classroom or even at home uh. when it comes to girls and boys or when it comes to rich and poor students mm. or when it comes to issues of children with disabilities and those because mm. similarly where there is a clear discrimination when it comes to girls and boys oh yes as, as you know that in many of our schools and some of you also would know all yes. the data from it that if we look at synth for example huh. Because there are not enough girls' schools, the girls or the families huh. made decisions that they'll just walk into the boys' schools. Oh, good for so them. So the boys' schools became <laughs> co-ed schools. We huh. have the largest number of co-ed schools in Sin. And that is uh, not by design, but by default. Hmm. And now by design because they have accepted Cycle it. Cycle back to issues of inclusivity. And Mr. Khan, because you, you, know, you work with policy, I think it's really interesting that, like Ms. Jamil said, that co-ed schools need to have their own approach uh, as opposed to schools that are segregated by gender. But do you feel that girls learn better in all girls schools? Because I do know that there are some statistics there. Well, uh, there is uh, some statistics and some anecdotal evidence mm. also. And that's yeah. uh, from what experience tells us is two reasons. 
A, hmm. the girls who actually manage to huh. get into schools is a small percentage. They do look at it as an opportunity, which they know is not easily available to many others. And there's a, a degree of seriousness. Yes. And even among teachers, the general understanding that the female teachers, uh, because for men, a lot of times, it's not the first choice employment. But for a lot of females, oh. it is the only uh, opportunity where they're allowed to go in. So mm. the degree of seriousness and the degree of commitment, you can see a difference by and large. I would not say in every case, but yeah. by and large, you can see that difference. And that may be one of the reasons uh, why you see a bit of a better uh, result. Even if you enter a girls' school, you will you'll see that the environment is cleaner, better, more, you know. In, mm. in that sense, mm. you get a better feel. So that may be because of the very few who get that opportunity try to make the best of it. No, that's really interesting. That I think that's a really interesting point there. That teaching for a lot of women is is their primary um, is their primary job. But does that also mean then that it this could also be a potential barrier towards equitable and an inclusive learning approach? Where if you don't have enough female teachers to staff an all girls school, then girls will be forced to kind of be in a co-ed environment. Yes, 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 uh, definitely it would be, uh, but going a little beyond that, I mm. think it's uh, what, what this is, what the mind does not know, the eye cannot see. I think the recognition of what is inclusive, mm. what is equitable, what does mm. gender mean, at the policy level, I've seen very, very little understanding of these concepts. Mm. And unless it becomes part of your system, uh, at the policy level. Even globally, the conversation around education, there's so much emphasis on getting girls into school and getting young women into school and keeping children in school. Then why are we still not making the kind of progress that we should be? The, the policy at the implementation level, by and large, has been getting more girls' schools, getting more girls into school, and it has yes. worked. It has yes. worked. It's not that it's all negative. Uh, we were looking at data in Balochistan, and what we saw was that as the number of schools increased, the percentage of enrollment increased in the same proportion. So mm -hmm. a lot of times when we are actually uh, criticizing the demand side of education, the parents, we don't recognize that we are not providing enough opportunities also. Mm -hmm. And there is generally a gap on the supply side in terms of number of schools available for girls and for boys. And wherever that has changed, the enrollment of girls has improved. But when I talk of inclusiveness and equity, it goes beyond just availability of schools. Right. And no, I'm just saying that, um, generally speaking, in our planning, uh, although we may, as Sami said, have all the right words hmm. uh, in our single national curriculum, which has just come up for yes. primary, or even in the new education policy that the government is now working on as we speak, on uh, which is meant to come out in 2021. We'll have all of that. And, you know, in the last 10 years, our data regimes have become better and better. Which is promising. Which is excellent. Mm. So we've got better data. Yeah. We know exactly the catchment areas mm. where girls do not have access. Mm. We know exactly not at the detailed facility level, number of toilets, number yes. of rooms, uh, size wow. of everything <laughs> is there. <laughs> Non-teaching staff, uh. teach, we have everything. Yeah. But when it comes to planning and implementing what you know needs to be done, yeah. given the principles of policy and planning that we've committed ourselves mm. to. You know, Pakistan, I think, comes now is emerging as one of the most innovative, cutting-edge countries. Mm. So you've hey. got amazing okay. people doing great work. If you were to bring in, you know, going, you know, out of the box thinking, bring yeah. in architects, engineers, um. health people, cross-sectorally working on, you know, what would be the solutions in space X or Y? Mm. I think they would. But similarly, you know, Mina, another big issue is in this whole area of business of equity, and you'll be shocked that in so we are about 40% urbanized already, hmm. going to 50% urbanization by 2025, planning for deserts, planning for mountains, planning for urban slums, etc. where principles of equity and inclusion are so critical. Yes. That is like, you know, one big layer of work huh. where, you know, imagination and very intensive work and different kinds of costing needs to come in. Huh. You can't work with one size fit all. You have Quite to right. go and with it, different I things. I think the, the one-size-fits-all model is one that I'm sure around the globe doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't work anywhere. It's just 
<laughs> so you can't That's have a standard live. Live. <laughs> And we're going to take a very quick break at this point. Stay with us. Welcome back to the coffee table. We've been having a fascinating and really complex conversation about the ways that we need to be approaching education to make it a more effective and sort of top-notch system. So, Mr. Khan, I was reading about, how, we've been talking about sustainability development goals, but how, and when we think of sustainability, as a layperson, I, for example, often think of it just in terms of, for example, the environment, where a sustainable approach to X or Y. But it's really interesting to think of education as part of sustainable development. Now, where's the link there? I, I think, well, you see, education is one area where you can target any policy and achieve it over a decade plus time. Ah. So normally what we say is all other policies hmm. fill the gap while education takes its time in, in doing it. So if you're looking at environment, you're looking at other issues, hmm. the right type of education uh, properly implemented uh, will give you a generation which will solve those problems. Ah. Uh, because a lot ah. of times what we talk of problems are problems of a response of a society. And, and mm. if, if a society is not aware of issues, it mm. won't be able to solve them. And education is the key. Um, and, and that's what every country keeps on doing. New issues come up, while they solve them, they also see how to bring them into education and how to have a long-term situation where that problem gets resolved. So when we say sustainable, well, there's, there's a lot of connotations to that word. I'll just say, you know, if you are aware of what you, where you want to go with your education and how, more critically how, because as we said, all the right words are being used, then you can solve a lot of your problems, at least in the long run, through education. Hmm. And I really like that idea, and I think it comes back to what we were talking about right in the beginning of the show, is how, it, how an, an education should help uh, a person develop their critical and, and creative thinking facilities so that you can use it in these ways because and we can come up with our own solutions to our own unique problems like everybody has problems absolutely so people like us who come from the education yes feel feel that this is an anchor goal of the 17 goals hmm. uh, it, because every research points to the fact that with education you can have you can have poverty reduction hmm. have uh, better health nutrition, uh, access to economic opportunities, mm. uh, play a more active role in climate change, have better uh, cities, more safer cities, uh, so more gender equality. Mm. So the cross-cutting aspect of yeah. education to all aspects of sustainability yeah. for human survival and development, we feel, you know, in this whole people, planet, prosperity, peace, etc., yes. really is is like the gelling factor huh. for sustainable uh, development goals. Huh. Um, many of us have been involved in the making of the sustainable development goals, and not to forget the last one, which is goal number 17, which is on partnerships. Ah. So we think that <coughs> education really provides that gelling hmm. to all the other 16 goals. Huh. And uh, you can... And I think a lot of exercises have been done to see the linkages across goals. And huh. actually, they're quite fascinating exercises, mm -hmm. but many people should see, educators and teachers should see. So it should not look as if, you know, we're talking about something which is very foreign, global. In fact, it is so localized. Huh. Uh, every classroom or a teacher should know how to link huh. aspects of education to health to nutrition to the marketplace. Yes. My favorite one is that image huh. of taking a child outside the classroom uh, to the um, fruit wala and the vegetable yeah. wala and yeah. to see not just the colors, but look at where they come from, where were uh. they grown, can you count them, can you draw them, mm. can you write about mm. them? And suddenly you begin to see so many linkages with science, with uh. Uh, expression, with chemistry, with 
with uh, environment, with uh, so many things. The how do how does how do uh, we produce something? How what kind of how does we how do we run an economy? Yeah. Uh, what is the market looking like, yeah. etc. And it's sort of like you know, it's also an individual's place in a community also, yes. where you're able to see <laughs> how you don't function as an island, yes, but as the product of all of these processes Absolutely. around you. You know what happened? Why couldn't we get enough wheat this year? Yes. Why didn't the oranges blossom the way? Or come out the way we want. Thought ah. that this crop would come out, and those are the kind of skills that we want our teachers, who are already magicians, to perform even better. Yes. But that means providing that space. Yeah. And so you know, I keep thinking, Mina. You know, um, very recently, out of one of the initiatives that I've been involved in as a commissioner for education, the Education Commission globally, has been uh, the Education Cannot Wait Fund, which we mm. uh, pushed. And that's a global fund. That's a global mm. fund. Mm. And the Education Cannot Wait movement began yes. from there that look at the emergencies. And the emergencies are growing and look, for COVID, of course, is a yes. global in emergency. Mm. But then when you're looking at delivering education in camps huh. or in emergencies or refugee populations, you know, or the Rohingya are coming mm -hmm. somewhere or whatever, you have to totally think out of the box. Yes. And you begin to see a global community coming together, rallying for resources for people who are getting marginalized. Mm. Mm. And also to think, Okay, what can we do so that they're better prepared when they come out of this emergency? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think this whole atmosphere of a global community yes. coming together, and which global community is very much active in Pakistan also. For yes. example, the Global Partnership Education Fund, mm -hmm. another massive global resource, mm -hmm. which is working across Africa, all the countries where yes. there is need. We have, I think, a tremendous way to look at what are best practices, what's mm. happening which is more lively, bringing more results yeah. in other parts of the world. Yeah. And I think Pakistan, we need to become far more uh, open to looking at solutions in Africa, fascinating, East, West Africa, North, South, and sort of or Latin America. And using what they are doing Absolutely. and adapting it to suit us and to sort of and find our, solutions for or ourselves. our experiences going to other places. And I think uh, we have, I think that's like, so you have an inward and ex uh, an internal and yes. also an external looking huh. experiences. We should be open our education systems and people involved in it, whether from public or non-state yes. sector, yes. need to be far more open to what are seen as external huh. uh, happenings huh. and practices. Mr. Khan, what do you think about that? What can we learn from the global uh, approach? Well, as I said, it's first we should be prepared to learn before we yes. can learn. <laughs> I, and that's where my problem comes in. So I, I still think it, it, unless it's country-led, it's very mm. important to learn from international experiences. Every country in the world does that. Uh, every serious policymaker does that. A lot of these things, you know, people like Vela Saiba will continue to struggle. She's struggled for much longer than I have. I have a lot of respect for all the work that she's done. And she, she has more patience than I have. She continues to engage with the government and tries to find solutions. But it gets frustrated because of this, uh, the, the, the way the quality of the technical level bureaucracy of education has declined. And you cannot get through ideas easily, if mm -hmm. at all. And even when you get them, you have massive losses at implementation level. Mm. So Khan, that's, that needs to change. Mm. Yes. You mentioned Sorry. previously we were talking about demand and you mentioned parents. Do you feel that in your experience working in the community and things, do you feel that parents are eager and willing and want to put their children in schools and they're committed to this process? So doing a kind of cost benefit analysis and then this sort of goes back to quality of education. That if we are able to provide a quality of education that is reassuring to a parent, then that's an incentive for them to keep their child in school longer. So really all of these goals that we've been talking about are all ways and strategies that can keep children in school as long as possible. The demand side is phenomenal, as I'm hmm. saying. I mean, I remember as far back as 2002 when we were doing the Education Sector Reforms Action Plan, going to Balochistan and a mother, we asked a mother, uh, you know, do you want your girl to complete metric? Yes. Or eighth? And she said, why are you stopping at that? Oh, wonderful. These are rural yes. mothers. We want our girls to be able to be educated for 
I mean, as high as possible. Why not university? Mm. Why not become a doctor? So I think the demand side is a very, is a thriving area. Oh. Oh. Uh, our biggest challenge is that we don't have sufficient facilities mm. at the post-primary levels. Yes. And even at the primary or even middle secondary levels, whatever we have is certainly not reassuring for parents or the distance may be such. But I've even seen parents who, which is, a, by the way, a very difficult decision to make, to sending their daughters to a relative's home in a, yeah. in a city or a town to finish her middle or her secondary. Ah. Now, that takes hmm. a lot. That's because a lot of our, commitment. Because uh, uh, the facilities, the gaps between primary to middle to secondary are so huge, which gets reflected in our net enrollment rates. Do you feel like this happens in other communities around the world also where poverty is an issue? And, you know, you have sub-Saharan African countries and this is just a common kind of thread yes. that's running through. Every Everywhere, mm. wherever you have the supply chain, and you know, everywhere, by the way, the demand is fantastic. I've done a lot of cross-country studies. Oh. Uh, wherever the supply challenges remain massive. So the question is yes. of governance. When countries make a decision mm. of where their best resources need to go, how mindful they are of when they or if they are doing sufficient investments in human capital. Mm. And if they're not making those, those intelligent in investments, well, they suffer. Quite whether right. it's sub-Saharan Africa, uh. whether, and you know, sadly in the whole of South Asia. So, mm. you know, you look at the wonderful talent in this Quite country. Right. And it and also say, kind of seems almost uh, counterintuitive to not invest in human yeah. capital. And surely most governments want these things for their so populace. So every South Asian country said, we want 100% primary, we want 100% huh. secondary, and that's what you're seeing in Nepal, in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, even, well, Maldives was always ahead, Bhutan. Yes. So the question is, yes, I think, will education, will education become central to nation building, to mm. global competitiveness, yes. to really making... Uh, or, may, or making your commitment and fulfillment as a politician. Yes. You know, coming, making it happen for the citizen who gave you vote. Quite right. I mean, Mr. Khan, what do you think about this? Because this is also a kind of global community um, goal that everybody's trying to achieve. Like, it, you know, what's, why? Well, we should do it faster. <laughs> I, I think one one thing that I'd like to add here is the degree of seriousness about education uh, mm -hmm. within the government and the governments, including the provincial governments, I've seen an increase in the last 20 years. Ah. Hmm. Uh, it's not necessarily in terms of funds only, it's in terms of uh, the rhetoric coming out, the statements coming out, the time allocated to education by, you know, chief ministers and ministers. So I think we're getting some very good young people coming in from abroad, getting these degrees in education. We do not have what I would say in a real sense a champion of education who, who not only, you know, talks about education, also comprehends education and has an open mind to how it works and how it should work and talks to the right people and, mm -hmm. and gets those mm -hmm. ideas through. Yeah. I like that That's idea, the having a champion of education. I like that idea. Fine. Hero, an education hero. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there are more and more education heroes and champions. I think, as Sami said, we are seeing a much more, I mean, at least an open traction, conversations on education. No literature festival of adults or children is completed without speaking about yes. uh, education challenges and how they can be overcome. Absolutely. It's and an I'm glad open that you, conversation. I'm, and I'm glad that you talk, brought up the festivals because they are so well attended. And Absolutely. so many kiddos come and yes. parents bring them. All and you have kinds, teachers, every class. And it's clearly there is such an interest yes. in wanting to learn. And Absolutely. it's all out there. And and the Idara Italimo Agahi has set up this wonderful little library yes. in DG called DG Kutub Khana. Well, those are actually... You know, in our, my visits that I go to the oh. field, I see amazing communities, sometimes just lost to the world oh. because they've not been connected. Mm. But I see some intelligent young people 
who are educated. Yes. And and everybody's saying, ma'am, what can we do? How can we really make our children also be a part yeah. of this? And I thought, well, we can. Suppose we sent you a trunk full of books mm. and also maps and maybe even a tablet so you are all you know, you feel you're second to none. You're Quite linked right. with technology. Mm. Would you be able to become a volunteer yes. and make those books move from neighborhood to neighborhood? Mm. But we don't have money. No. It's not a. It's not. But a, you have a lot uh, of heart. It's not a financial <laughs> transaction. It is really uh, where you create your own social capital. But yes, we will. You can have access to the tablet, and we'll try to connect you to other youth networks. Oh. And you know, there was such a wonderful response. So we started the first one in the Mubarak village hmm. just outside Karachi and then the next one is happening in Hunza another one going to again in Baluchistan in South hmm. in month and, these are and all another one to the Kaza uh, Hazara communities oh, so, and these are all volunteers Volun young, young educated. teachers so it's like you know something like your barefoot doctors here ah. your barefoot people who are helping in learning so the idea was educated young people in com in remote yes, communities yes. and reaching, out to, reaching out to their own Yes. Where they feel good that they are ah. not just a, a problem, but they are part of a solution. Quite right. And, and that was the thought. Yeah, and sort of coming back to that idea that education should also be a source of happiness for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And I you think know, it's, it's so wonderful. lovely when children are saying, you know, I read this and I made my mother read this yes. also. And I read this story out to my grandmother or my sibling. Or now I know how to use a tablet. Oh, or I can draw lovely. something. And we begin to... And so one of the things that we that's suggested, really how about tremendous. bringing more stories ah. from those remote communities also. <coughs> That's I tremendous. think we can do so much. Uh, our people are ready. So yeah. taking They're from the queue, the it. demand is there. Mm. And if you have an educated young people, the person there, or but no libraries or no wonderful books beyond your textbooks or something, how about doing this? And it only costs 65,000, which includes a uh, 1,000 rupees a month for your internet connection, if you mm, can get it, mm, or fill up mm, to fill it up. Mm, mm, and uh, also, and that's it. And the rest of tremendous. it, and a tablet. And I really so love the idea that it's community building by the community and just bringing Absolutely. everyone together. And there's so much heart there. And thank you so much, Mr. No, Reed. It's, it's thank you so much, pleasure. Mr. Khan, for joining me today and really helping me unpack this incredibly complex, but strangely kind of, I, I think I, I'm leaving the show on, on, on a hopeful note because there's so much work to be done, but it is being done, and it's a global effort. And if you know, and if we all are able to create these links of partnership between all of us, and you know, all the all the kids can read and write, and what's more wonderful than that? Thank you guys for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time on the coffee table. Bye now.